Yeah. So come west. Thank you, Senator Brockman. Being 2 p.m. Questions without notice. Senator Walsh. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Yesterday, the minister asserted that, and I quote, every aged care worker who wants access to a vaccine right now has access to a vaccine right now. Does the minister stand by his statement? The minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Yes, Mr President. Uh, thanks, Senator Walsh, for the question. Yes, I do stand by the statement. Senator Walsh, supplementary question. Yesterday, the Victorian government was forced to stop bookings for the Pfizer vaccine, including for aged care workers, due to constraints of the supply of the Commonwealth program. Can the minister confirm that not all aged care workers who want a vaccine right now can access one? Order. Order. I'll call Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Thanks, Senator Walsh, for the question. Um, and I, I do... Uh, do confirm that they have support, have availability, uh, and so I have a, a text message from uh, Minister Foley from Victoria, who I contacted when I saw a story in the Guardian earlier in the day that was reporting that that was the case. Uh, and Minister Foley says, "Not right. They are wrong. They still have priority. It's nonsense. We will get onto them." So, Minister Foley, Mr. President, Minister Foley, Minister Foley. He's order. going to order. So, order. So, Mr. President, order. Um, aged care workers, aged care order. workers continue to have access. In fact, they have priority access directly, directly from the, the Victorian Minister, who I have to say I thank for his cooperation order. and also my conversation earlier with Minister Donnellan. We continue to work very, very cooperatively with the Victorian government Order. to ensure Senator the rollout Colbeck, and time the work for the for answer has remain... expired. Senator Walsh, a final supplementary question. Yesterday, this minister conceded the Morrison government has had to firstly reassess our vaccine rollout, secondly, again, re-pivot the rollout, and finally, reset the vaccine rollout for the aged care wo workforce on a number of occasions. Given the Victorian government's decision as a result of supply constraints of the Commonwealth, has the Morrison government had to reassess, re-pivot and reset its rollout yet again? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Order. Um, the, prob the problem of reading a set question after not listening to the uh, answers to the previous two questions, Mr President, as I've clearly Order. articulated and have ca had confirmed by the Victorian Minister, the, the Order. Workers in Victoria continue to have priority access to vaccines. It is a pity, Mr. President, uh, that uh, the Senator didn't take notice of the first questions that we answered. We continue to work. We continue to work very cooperatively with the Victorian government in the interests of getting aged care workers vaccinated, uh, and we will continue to do that, Mr. President. It is a pity. It is a pity that the Labor Party here in Canberra continue to try and undermine continue to try Order. and undermine the confidence Order. in the uh, vaccination rollout process for their own political purposes mr president they continue to make Order. these these Order. disgraceful Senator Wong. these disgraceful accusations Order. mr president Order. that are simply Sorry. not Order. Senator true. Wong, there is too much noise in the chamber there is too much noise in the chamber. I was repeatedly calling senators to order. Order. Senator, all, Senator Wong. Senator Wong, please. Senator Henderson. Senator Dean Smith. Thank you very much, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Can the minister please explain to the Senate how the Australia-UK Free Trade Agreement enhances and strengthens Australia's economic recovery? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Well, thanks, uh, thanks, Mr President. I thank Senator Smith for his question. I know that Senator Smith, uh, like all coalition senators, but perhaps none more so than Senator Smith, uh, welcomes the in principle agreement of the Australia United Kingdom free trade agreement. And indeed, Senator Wong, I, I have no doubt that Senator Smith will be sending a tariff free bottle uh, of Australian craft made gin for Her Majesty anytime soon. But seriously, Mr. President, I am pleased to confirm that Australia and the UK have reached in principle agreement in relation to this free trade agreement. A free trade agreement that will once again deliver more jobs for Australians 
more opportunities for Australian exporters and bring both our countries closer together in this current strategic challenging environment. This was an agreement negotiated from scratch in record time, reflecting the close affinity of our two nations and the robust industrial logic of the agreement that has been delivered. This free trade agreement is the right deal for both Australia and the UK, providing each of our nations with greater access to a range of high quality products, greater access for businesses and workers, greater access for quality services exchange, driving economic growth and job creation. It is significant that the UK turned to Australia to negotiate its first bilateral agreement since leaving the European Union. The UK is already Australia's fifth largest trading partner in 2019-20, with two-way trade worth $36.7 billion, the second largest source of investment stock value, valued at $738 billion. And pleasingly, under this agreement, the UK will liberalise Australian imports into the UK, with 99 per cent of Australian goods set to enter the UK duty-free. This is good news for our farmers, our businesses and Australian jobs. Senator Smith, a supplementary question. Mr President, can the minister advise how this free trade agreement demonstrates the coalition government's broader commitment to free trade? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, this agreement does build on a tremendous record of delivering expanded trade opportunities for Australian exporters, for Australian farmers and small businesses across the nation. Under the coalition, 10 free trade agreements have been concluded growing the coverage of Australian exports that enjoy preferential access into international export markets from around 26 per cent of exports when we were elected to office to now around 75 per cent of Australia's exports that will enjoy that market advantage in international export markets as a result of these trade agreements. These free trade agreements with our major trading partners, be they the North Asian partners, be they the recently concluded and entered into force agreement with Indonesia, be they the multi-party agreements such as the Trans-Pacific Partnership or the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, or indeed our close partnership with our Pacific Island partners, all of them enhancing opportunities for economic growth across these partners. Senator Smith, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister outline to the Senate what are the benefits of free trade to Australia and to every Australian? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, enhanced export opportunities create more jobs for more Australians. All of the research shows they generate more high-paying Australian jobs and, in doing so, help to create the business and economic strength and resilience to fund the essential services that all Australians rely upon. Australian businesses that export on average hire 23 per cent more staff, pay 11 per cent higher wages and have labour productivity 13 per cent higher than non-exporters. Trade of goods and services represented some 40 per cent of Australia's GDP in 2020. We have delivered time and again in terms of expanding the choice and range of opportunities for Australian exporters. Our government has made sure that we expand those opportunities across our near region of ASEAN nations, across our broader region in North Asia, across the Pacific and with new trade agreements providing access to Mexico and Canada for the first time ever, now to the UK, and we aspire to the EU Order. and other Senator agreements Birmingham. to be struck in the months Senator, and years to come. Senator Carr. Uh, Mr President, my question uh, without notice is to the minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. And given that the minister yesterday confirmed, and I quote, the Australian government is responsible for the vaccination rollout of residents and workers in residential aged care, I'd ask, can the minister explain why the Morrison government has failed to put in place any system to track COVID-19 vaccination of aged care workers? The minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Uh, well, Senator uh, Carr, thank you for the question, Mr President. Uh, it's not true that we don't have a system to track uh, the vaccination of aged care workers. Uh, we, 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 we do Order. have a system to track the vaccination Order. of aged care workers, Mr President. There's a portal that came live uh, a week and a half ago. It's compulsory as of yesterday for aged care uh, providers to report into that portal, uh, Mr President. Order. Uh, as we advised, as we, as we advised the, the, the Senate in Committee had estimates a couple of weeks ago. So, Mr President, there is a system in place. 
there is a system in place to provide uh, with to, to report work of vac vaccinations in uh, for COVID-19. Uh, it has it has been developed uh, as a part Order. of our realignment of the system Order. of vaccination of aged care workers, uh, Mr. President, and uh, we will continue to report those pub those figures publicly as we've indicated uh, we would at estimates. Order. Order. Senator Carr is on his feet. Senator Carr, thank you, Mr. Question. President. I'd ask why did the Morrison government repeatedly reject offers to work cooperatively with the private sector for with with technology enabling the tracking of COVID-19 vaccinations and aged care prior to the establishment of the portal? Senator Colbeck. Uh, Mr. President. Uh, I don't believe that the government has actually rejected any offers. We speak to a lot of we we we, uh, we speak to a lot of uh, providers of technology to do a number of things. I've had a number of conversations with providers of technology with respect to worker registration, for example, uh, and uh, we continue on a number of occasions and a number of different providers. Uh, some of those providers have subsequently come back to us suggesting that their worker registration process. Uh, might assist us with some of the other things that we were looking to achieve, Mr. President. Uh, we continue to have those discussions, Mr. President. But we, of course, we have committed Order. as a part of our Royal Commission response to a workforce registration process. We have committed to that, and, and, and that will be implemented in conjunction with the sector. But we, what we haven't done is we haven't gone to any private sector Order. proprietary businesses uh, to take up their particular. Systems. We're, we're looking to develop a system that provides for registration of the workforce more generally, Mr. President. And one of the features of that workforce Order. registration Senator scheme Colbeck, that we are putting in place could be expired. Order. There's Senator Carr, a final supplementary question. With 84% of the tragic and deadly COVID-19 outbreaks in Victorian residential aged care facilities were actually from infected staff members. Why, Minister, did you not heed the warnings of those private sector companies and who now say you are looking to in their office of assistance? Why should older Australians have any confidence, Minister, that you can actually help keep Order. them safe? Senator Carr. Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr President. And I completely reject the premise of Senator Carr's question. Uh, it's factually Incorrect, Mr. President. We continue. Order, uh, uh, Miss, Miss, it, Mr. President. Uh, Order. We continue to work uh, it, continuously to support senior Australians to ensure that they have access to vaccines, that the workforce continue to have access to vaccines, and that we, importantly, uh, ensure that the aged care residents are vaccinated. And as of yesterday, Mr. President. Uh, over 94 per cent of aged care providers have seen two visits of uh, va uh, vaccinators to provide the doses. 100 per cent of aged care providers have had a first visit, uh, and in fact, I th the figure now is uh, uh, is, is 147,879 residents. Have been vaccinated, Order. Mr. President. Senator so Colbeck, we continue time our for the work answer has expired. Time for the answer has expired. Senator Wong, you're seeking the yes, call. Yes, I, I seek the call. I seek leave to table the answer to the question on notice, confirming that 84 per cent of the tragic and deadly COVID-19 outbreaks in Victorian and facilities were from a staff member. Granted. No, no, it hasn't been. This, uh, is the, this, is the, this is the fact. Senator you Wong, please. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, President. My question is to Minister Rustin, representing the Minister for Resources. The G7 said earlier this week that genuine climate action requires countries to stop giving public subsidies to fossil fuels by 2025, and the International Energy Agency has said there should be no new coal, oil or gas projects to prevent climate disaster. Given this clear message from our international trading partners and experts, why is this government intent on opening up a climate bomb and handing a quarter of a million dollars in public money to allow the Northern Territory Labor government to frack the Beedaloo Basin and opening up acreage that would allow new offshore oil and gas wells near the Twelve Apostles? 
The Minister representing the Minister for Resources, Water and Northern Australia, Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President, and thank you, Senator Waters, for your question. Well, first and foremost, the, the government, the, the Morrison McCormack government, is absolutely committed to make sure that we work with the Australian public to make sure that we have uh, an energy mix in this country that, first of all, is reliable and affordable, but at the same time that we meet our international obligations as well as protecting our environment. And we actually believe, Senator Waters, that we can do all of those things at the same time. Um, you refer um, to a, a, a number of projects. Um, you know, as an example, um, you know, the, the project um, in Victoria that you're referring to, or offshore in Victoria. I mean, clearly, we already have independent regulators that have processes in place yeah. in which to assess to make sure that any project that is undertaken in our amazing Australian environment is protected in the process. But we also have resources that are owned by the Australian people. These resources are for the benefit of all Australians, and as long as they are extracted in a mechanism and a manner in which the environment is protected, then every Australian deserves to be able to benefit from the benefits of being able to get access to those resources. So, in the case of the Victorian offshore program that you're referring to, of course, NOPSEMA is the independent regulator, and they will make sure they go through their robust and independent processes to make sure that any in, uh, any uh, exploration, which is what you're referring to, that is undertaken, is undertaken in a manner that is consistent with the protection yeah. of Australia's environment. So, I mean, we have been very clear as a government that we believe that we have multiple obligations, obligations to the Australian public mm -hmm. for cheap, reliable and accessible power, but we also have an obligation to our international requirement on carbon emissions and we have an obligation to make sure that we protect our environment, our very precious environment, but we will do so in a manner in which we can extract the resources that are the propriety property of all Australians and all Australians deserve order, to benefit from Senator them. Rustin. Senator Order, Senator Waters, supplementary question. And the Northern Territory inquiry into fracking said there should be full informed consent from traditional owners before any exploration or fracking takes place given the impacts on cultural heritage, water resources and access to land. Traditional owners from lands covered by the Empire Energy Licence Area in the Beetaloo are in the building today, saying that they have not been properly consulted or given their consent. How can the minister justify handing out public money for projects that do not have the consent of traditional owners? Senator Rustin. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you, uh, Senator Waters, for your, your continued uh, for your other next question. Um, first and foremost, there is an absolutely required process by which the government and its instrumentalities have to go through to make sure appropriate consultation is taken place uh, to make sure that everybody who has an interest in a particular project has the opportunity to, to be heard. Now, we are not in any way suggesting that any of those processes are going to be circumnavigated. They will be thoroughly adhered to and gone through, and that includes consultation with all of the people who are impacted by any of these developments, including the Beetaloo Basin development that you're referring to uh, in the Northern Territory. I mean, the Beetaloo Basin is a very, very important resource for Australia, but I also understand that it is, it is a very important issue for many Australians, and that's why we have robust processes in place to make sure that they are protected the people's uh, interests are able to be heard, and broad consultation will be undertaken to ensure everybody's Order, interests are heard. Senator Rustin. Senator Waters, a final supplementary question. Thanks, President. One of the biggest investors in the Bidaloo Basin is Empire Energy, run by Paul Espy, chair of the Liberal Party's Menzies Centre, who has donated nearly uh, a quarter of a million dollars to the Liberal Party in recent years. Other significant players include Origin, Order, Santos, Gemini right. and billionaire Order. Gina Reinhart. Order on my right, so I can hear the question. Senator Waters, continue. Thank you, Chair. Other significant players include Origin, Santos, Gemin Gemina and billionaire Gina Reinhart, all donors and friends of the Liberal Party. Why is the government handing out Order. public Senator money Waters. to its donor Time mates the against the advice of— expired. Senator Waters. Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, first and foremost, I reject the underlying premise of the, of the accusations that are being made by Senator Waters. Um, the decisions in relation to the exploration and the extraction of valuable resources that belong to the Australian public are undertaken by independent and thorough means. The importance of this sector to Australia cannot be understated. The importance to our rural and regional communities because of the economic development, because of the jobs that are created, but the broader impact that it provides to the Australian economy 
cannot be understated. But to suggest that there is anything apart from a robust, transparent, defensible process that is undertaken to ensure that the extraction of these particular resources on behalf of every Australian is anything but that is completely and utterly false. And so I would Order. suggest that, uh, that the importance of making sure that we continue to meet all of our obligations, we continue to consult, but we continue to have a transparent process is absolutely Order. there for every Australian to see, and I don't know why you Order. can't Senator see it Senator Rustin. Senator Wong, were you seeking to table? No. Okay. Senator Bragg. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to Senator Payne, the Minister representing the Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment. Will the Minister please update the Senate on yesterday's historic announcement that Australia and the UK have an in-principle agreement on an FTA? And what does this mean for Australia? The Minister representing the Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, uh, Mr President, and I thank Senator Bragg uh, for his question, because it was an historic announcement last night in London, Mr President, between Prime Ministers Morrison and Johnson agreeing to the Australia-UK Free Trade Agreement that will deliver more Australian jobs and new opportunities for uh, our exporters. It's going to bring access to a, range of, a greater range of, of products, of greater access for businesses and workers, and more opportunities for Australian producers and farmers in the UK market. It is about creating new opportunities and jobs for business by eliminating tariffs on each other's goods and removing the red tape that slows trade down, by enhancing pathways for workers and young people to work in both countries, by making it easier for our service companies and professionals to do business in each other's markets and deepening our already very strong investment ties. In fact, the Australia-UK FTA is Australia's most ambitious free trade agreement with any country other than New Zealand. Both countries have made commercially significant commitments that will strengthen our diversification and export-focused COVID-19 recovery. The ambitious bilateral free trade agreement will also help pave the way for the UK's accession to the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for the Trans-Pacific Partnership, furthering our cooperation within the CPTPP uh, on a prosperous and secure Indo-Pacific. We have sent the world a very strong signal that we are trading nations that believe in democracy, open markets, high standards and the rules-based trading, global trading system. This still delivers a strong message about the strength and importance of this relationship between Australia and the United Kingdom, and it opens a new chapter in the long and close history between our two nations. Senator Bragg, a supplementary question. Thank you, Minister. How is the Morrison government working to further diversify Australia's exports? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I thank Senator Bragg for his supplementary question, because we know that uh, free and open trade will continue to drive economic growth as we emerge from the challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic. And so the, Australian co the coalition government is supporting Australian exporters to compete freely and fairly and securely. In fact, in last month's budget, we also announced significant new support to Australian exporters to ensure they can expand and diversify their markets as widely as possible. Despite COVID-19, Australia recorded a record trade surplus of $73 billion in 2020, up from $68 billion in 2019. Since this government was elected in 2013, Mr. President, the percentage of our trade covered by FTAs has grown from 26 per cent to what will be 75 per cent once the UK FTA takes effect. We welcome every opportunity to further diversify our exports because the more diversified your exports are, the better placed you are for the peaks Order. and troughs Senator of global Payne. commodity trade. Senator Bragg, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Minister. Uh, how is the Morrison government supporting a rules-based global trading system? Senator Payne. Mr President, the Australia-UK FTA will strengthen our post-COVID-19 economic recovery while signalling our very strong commitment to the global trade and international rules-based order. The coalition is working to keep global markets open and trade functioning, including through bodies such as the WTO, the G20 and APEC. We support a strong, effective world trade organisation, which is why both Minister Tian and I have met this year with the WTO's new Director-General, Dr Ngozi Okonjo Iwiala, in Geneva. Australia is working in close partnership with the WTO. We're leading a Cairns Group effort uh, to tackle distorting domestic support in agriculture. We continue to invest in and advocate for 
WTO reform to ensure a strong system of rules to secure the rights of Australian exporters, to provide opportunities for our businesses to grow and to create jobs for the future. Senator Brown. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for National Disability Insurance Scheme, Senator Reynolds. Can the minister confirm disability support workers were classified as Group 1A, the highest priority in the vaccine rollout? The Minister for the National Disability Insurance Scheme, Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President, and I thank uh, Senator Brown for that question. Uh, we have some very good news in terms of the progress now of the rollout, both for NDIS participants and also for workers and their primary carers. Uh, workers are in 1B uh, and are eligible and are all eligible now for vaccinations, and in fact are indeed becoming vaccinated. Senator Brown, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, um, <coughs> Minister. How many disability support workers have been fully vaccinated against COVID-19? Senator Reynolds. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, um, Mr. President. Uh, for all disability workforce, we don't have a central register because it, in the past we haven't had a need for a such Order. a register for a workforce that is quite transient and is also crossover with aged care and also Order. and Order. also sorry the Senator veterans. Reynolds, please. I, I have on my left, I have during question time repeatedly, repeatedly called senators to order. I'm having trouble again hearing a minister's answer. I would appreciate not being interjected on when I'm asking people to abide by the rules the chamber sets for itself. I don't make them up. Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mr. President. And I can confirm that NDIS workers uh, are not required to disclose to their provider or to the Commonwealth whether they have or have not been vaccinated. In the same way, they are not required and obligated to disclose a medical condition. However, irrespective of their vaccination status, uh, they are required to follow public health orders and are bound by workplace health and safety laws in relevant states and territories. Senator Brown, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I would ask that the minister go back and check which uh, group disability support workers are classified as, and also on what date it is 1A, as I understand it, not 1B. On, and what date will all disability support workers who want a vaccine be fully vaccinated against COVID-19? Senator Reynolds. Well, Senator Brown, I don't need to go back and check. Uh, it is in 1B. Uh, we recently made sure that all NDIS participants, uh, their workforce and their carers were in 1B. And in fact, all are eligible now. And there are many, uh, there are the four main uh, channels to get vaccinated. And we've also set up additional hubs based out of providers. Uh, Senator Brown, the answer is really up to the workforce themselves. Uh, they have the opportunity to voluntarily Order. be vaccinated, and uh, when they choose to get vaccinated, uh, they, they can be. Order. Senator Davey. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Agriculture, Drought and Emergency Management, Senator Rustin. Will the minister please outline how the new free trade agreement between Australia and the United Kingdom will provide our primary producers with new opportunities to export the world's best food, fibre and rice overseas? The minister representing the Minister for Agriculture, Drought and Emergency Management, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President, and thanks, Senator Davey, for her question, because, like uh, you, uh, Senator Davey, I know that Australian farmers will be the big yeah. winners for yeah. the free trade agreement yeah. that was negotiated between our Prime Minister and Prime Minister Johnson um, overnight. Um, and the deal will open up such an amazing new set of avenues for our farmers uh, and the broader agricultural sector, because the agriculture sector has always been terribly important for the Australian economy, and none more so than it is at the moment as we recover from the COVID pandemic. 
Um, this free trade agreement is, uh, is, is a very comprehensive agreement. It's high quality and it's mutually beneficial uh, for, uh, for both of our countries, but most particularly for our agricultural sector. It will allow 99 per cent of Australian goods entering the UK to be duty free. And that includes yeah. the immediate elimination of tariffs on wine, which means a lot to the area that I come from, and rice, which means a lot to the area that you come from, Senator Davey. Um, so beef tariffs will be eliminated over 10 years. Right now, we'll get immediate access to 35 tonnes of beef, uh, and that quota will rise to 110,000 tonnes. Sheep meat tariffs will be eliminated after 10 years as well, which means immediate access to 25,000 tonnes, which will rise to 75,000 yeah. tonnes. Yeah. Um, sugar tariffs will be eliminated over eight years, dairy tariffs over five years. This agreement absolutely means that our farmers now have another yeah. new and exciting market for which they can sell in their amazing, high-quality Australian produce. And not only that, Senator Davey, but they will be able to access markets that are actually paying really good prices and understand what the quality of Australian produce is all about. So it has never been more important for Australian farmers to have a diversity of markets of which they can access. And this new trade agreement is a win for us. Yeah. It's a win for our country, but it's most particularly a win for our rural economies. Yeah. Senator Davey, a supplementary question. Thank you. Will the minister outline the importance of export opportunities like this free trade agreement for Australian primary producers in meeting the industry's goal of $100 billion of agricultural production by 2030. Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. Well, this year, farm grape prices and some farm grape production is set to reach an all-time high of $66.3 billion. And of that, $47 billion will be generated because of our exporting of our fantastic primary produce. We know that we grow amazing food, but 80 million people, not just here in Australia but around the world, are fed by Australian producers. 1.6 million people in Australia are employed by the agricultural sector through its supply chain, and more than 334,000 Australians are employed directly in our agricultural sector. This is fantastic news for the whole of Australia, but most particularly to the areas, uh, the regional areas that support our agricultural sector. We know our primary producers are absolutely first class. Uh, they're innovative, they're forward thinking, and they're always prepared to have a go. So this free trade agreement helps them be able to help themselves to support Australia. Senator Davey, a final supplementary question. Thank you. And how, how is the Liberal and National Government supporting primary producers to take advantage of the new export opportunities such as the Australia-UK Free Trade Agreement? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. Well, we absolutely, as a government, the, the Morrison-McCormack government, understand the importance not just of sustaining our agricultural sector but building it, because it is such an important uh, part of the Australian economy. So we've invested nearly $100 million in the current budget, in the 21-22 budget, to make sure that we are providing the agricultural sector with the supports and tools so they can take advantage of the opportunities that are presented by these new free trade agreements, such as the one that has been struck in the last 24 hours. We want to transform the way that we support our agricultural sector, particularly around export services and support for exporters. The busting congestion for ag agricultural exporters package continues to modernise and streamline our systems. Um, the package will also generate more than $200 million in other benefits for the agricultural sector um, by 2030. And as part of the Agribusiness Expansion Initiative, we are supporting 2,000 uh, agri-food exporters yeah. through the AusTrade-led Accelerate Senator Rustin Program. Time has expired. <clears throat> Senator Hanson Young. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to Senator Birmingham, representing the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister told the G7 summit that Australia will join the High Ambition Coalition for Nature and People and that Australia is committed to protecting a combined 30 per cent of domestic land and ocean by 2030. But, of course, the goal of the HAC uh, minister is to protect 30 per cent land plus 30 per cent ocean. Isn't this just more trickery from your government to global commitments, just like wanting to use carryover credits to meet Paris uh, targets and commitments? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. 
Thanks, um, thanks, Mr. President, and Mr. President, uh, I thank Senator Hanson Young at least for the uh, opportunity to note uh, further some of the successes of the yeah, yeah, Prime yeah, Minister's yeah. visit uh, to the G7 summit yeah. and associated meetings. We've had the opportunity in question time today, of course, to highlight the benefits of the Australia-UK free trade agreement, but that wasn't the only agreement that the Prime Minister uh, signed as part of uh, part of his work overseas. Uh, the Prime Minister indeed made other commitments. Those included. Uh, hydrogen cooperation commitments with uh, Germany and with Singapore as part of our technology roadmap and our commitment to engaging with international partners around how it is we drive uh, down emissions in the future through new technologies that Australia can play a leadership role in. We signed an agreement uh, with Japan in relation to decarbonisation. Mr. President. Order. Senator uh, Hanson Young on a point of order. Mr President, I'd ask you to bring the minister to the question. Uh, it was a, in relation to the government's commitment to the HAC and the, tricking, the trickery and accounting that the Prime Order. Minister has used. Senator Hanson Young, it was a particularly broad question, and I've ruled before that when questions include part, contentious phrases, ministers have more discretion in answering. Um, I'm listening carefully to the minister, but specific questions can, are easier to make rulings around direct relevance. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Well, I was just referencing uh, an agreement. I would have thought the Greens would have quite welcomed the agreement between Australia and Japan in relation to cooperation on decarbonisation, building on those other agreements that the Prime Minister entered into whilst overseas. Now, Mr President, Senator Hanson Young has asked particularly about oceans, and of course Australia has, uh, has responsibility uh, for some of the broadest reach of oceans in the world. Uh, and that's why in the recent budget our government released a further $100 million as part of an oceans package to further strengthen our leadership in relation to marine management and ocean protection. Now, that includes some $30 million to restore coastal marine ecosystems, uh, particularly those systems such as mangroves, seagrasses and tidal marshes, but also some $40 million Mr. President, to expand the marine park network into the Indian Ocean and protect some 45 per cent Mr. President, of Australian waters, as well as extension in particular to incorporate sea country into Indigenous protected areas across some nine locations, further expanding not only Order. those Senator networks Birmingham, of protected areas, but especially of Indigenous has expired. Senator Hanson Young, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I note that the minister didn't reference the 30 per cent need for protection of domestic land. And isn't it true that if these weak environment laws that the that the Prime Minister wants pushed through this place this week, if they, if they were to pass the Senate, there's no way you could meet this commitment. The Prime Minister's just signed up to something he knows he will never be able to reach. Senator Birmingham. Mr. Mr. President, Mr. President, what, uh, what Senator Hanson Young describes as weak, our government is determined to make sure are effective. Our definition of effective isn't to simply have laws in place that are a quagmire of bureaucracy and stop everything. Our definition of effective as a government is to make sure that indeed they protect the nationally significant environmental assets that need protection, but they also facilitate development and opportunity across the Australian economy that jobs depend upon. Now again, Mr. President, in the recent budget we outlined some close to $30 million in further support around Australia's environment laws and particularly around the operation of the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act, funding to ensure the operation of an independent Environment Assurance Commissioner to pursue a pilot regional plan for priority development region in partnership with a state or territory to further support stakeholder engagement in relation to Indigenous cultural heritage. Things Order. I would expect the Senator Greens Birmingham, to welcome some of them, the but of course that they never expired. Give Senator Hanson Young, a final supplementary question. Thank you, uh, Mr President. Will Australia commit to a target of zero extinction, or is the Prime Minister intent on giving everything to the mining companies and nothing for the koalas? Yep. Senator Birmingham. And, and, and Mr President, uh, for, for the Greens and particularly for Senator Hanson Young, we know that there's the YouTube moment that will be sliced and diced into a little clip that will be used and, uh, and that it's all about the cheap grab, the cheap stunt and never, of course, about the serious policy work or analysis as to how you achieve 
the objectives of absolutely protecting Australia's biodiversity, of protecting Australia's wildlife, but also enabling, enabling business to be able to operate in a commercially competitive way in Australia in a very competitive global landscape. The types of approach our government seeks to bring, following the very thorough review of the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act, is all about ensuring that we have effective environmental protections in place, that we work in a more harmonised way with the states and territories for the application of those protections, but that we don't have a quagmire of bureaucracy that prohibits projects from even getting Order. off the ground, as the Greens Senator seem to prefer. Ciccone. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, my question is to the Minister for the National Disability Insurance Scheme, Senator Reynolds. At the recent round of uh, Senate estimates less than two weeks ago, we heard that out of uh, the 22,285 uh, people living with a disability, only 335 of them had both doses of the COVID-19 vaccine. Now, why were only 1.6 per cent of people living in a residential disability setting fully vaccinated, despite being in the priority 1A for the vaccine rollout? The Minister for the National Disability Insurance Scheme, Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank the Senator for that question. Uh, the issue of vaccinations for people with disabilities, particularly those on the NDIS, their carers and also their support workers, has been of uh, great importance to me and a great focus in my first couple of months in this job. Um, so we have actually had a significant increase over the last few weeks with the new measures that we've been implementing. Uh, we've now got uh, many more hubs, particularly based at providers. And again, I thank very much, uh, the, particularly the SIL providers, uh, for opening up their facilities around the nation and providing vaccinations both for participants, uh, for their carers and also for workers. Uh, since uh, the last lot of figures that are uh, published, we now have just under 50,000 NDIS participants who have had at least one dose of the vaccine, which is an increase of 18,700 since just the 25th of May. Now, this includes 9,500 people with disability living in residential aged care or el people eligible who are living in residential, uh, dis disability residential care under phase 1A of the scheme. And that's uh, now it's an increase of over 3,300 uh, since the 25th of May. So we are making significant uh, inroads. And again, it's due to a fantastic effort between the Department of Health, between our department, uh, and also now with the providers who, as I've said, I'm very grateful for their assistance in speeding up the rollout. Senator Ciccone, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, thank the Minister. Uh, Minister, Rosemary Simon, whose daughter lives in a group home in Albury, has said on uh, ABC Radio Melbourne recently, and I quote, nobody has been able to give me any information for months and they're not to be able to get through the 1800 number. The lack of information has just been appalling. If it's not as if the federal government hasn't had time to plan for this, she goes on to describe the Morrison government's vaccine rollout as "quote non-existent." Is she right, Senator Reynolds? Hmm. Uh, thank you very much for that question, and I would adv advise uh, all Australians living with disabilities, their carers, their family members, and also their workers, that there are many avenues now for them to receive uh, vaccinations. Uh, the main four channels that uh, everybody, including the family that you have just mentioned, Senator, uh, they can do. There's now more than 4,600 primary care sites uh, that they can go to. There are the state and territory operated clinics, which are now more than 600 across the nation. Uh, there's the Commonwealth inReach and hubs, uh, which are now being provided, as I've said, through NDIS providers who are making their facilities available, and they in particular have the transportation to assist to bring people in and meet their uh, special requirements according to their uh, disability. Uh, GPs are now doing inReach, and in some states, uh, pharmacies are now also doing inReach. So there are now many channels, and that information is available on the Department of Health's website, and it's also Order. available Senator via Reynolds. the NDIA website. Senator Ciccone, a final supplementary question. Uh, Minister, on what date will all Australians living in a residential disability setting be fully vaccinated against COVID-19? Senator Reynolds. 
Well, thank you very much, Senator, for that. Uh, my hope is as quickly as possible. But as this is a voluntary, uh, vo this is uh, vaccination is voluntary. Uh, ultimately, we've now made many more channels available for people with disability, their carers uh, and their support workers to get vaccinated, either within their within their home or uh, other facilities that they are living in, or that they can go or be transported to many facilities. So we have the channels available. Uh, we have the means of providing vaccination, but ultimately, uh, under this scheme, we cannot force anybody to be vaccinated. Senator McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, my question is to the Minister for International Development and the Pacific, Senator Selja. Can the minister update the Senate on how the highly successful Pacific Labor Scheme and Seasonal Worker Program is helping Australian farmers to harvest their crops? which is protecting jobs and regional communities through the impacts of COVID-19, as well as supporting economies within our region. Minister for International Development and the Pacific, Senator Seselja. Well, thank you very much, and I thank Senator McLaughlin for his question. I note his home state of South Australia's wonderful leadership in supporting Pacific labour mobility. Uh, now, firstly, uh, as we all respond to COVID-19, and look at economic recovery, I want to reiterate that there has never been a more important time for Australia to stand shoulder to shoulder with our partners across the Pacific. The Seasonal Worker Program and Pacific Labor Scheme have been instrumental in helping to address critical workforce shortages in rural and regional communities. There are now more than 12,000 Pacific and Timorese workers in Australia, with another 27,000 in the work-ready pool. In fact, Pacific Labor has been the lifeblood uh, for many Australian businesses and ensured fresh fruit and vegetables have reached our supermarkets and our tables. And the Australian government values the contribution that Pacific workers have made to our economy. The COVID-19 pandemic uh, has brought into sharp focus workforce shortages in critical sectors, including agriculture, and highlighted the importance of Pacific Labor. Since the restart of COVID safe recruitment of Pacific workers in September 2020, more than 7,400 Pacific workers have arrived and supported our horticulture and meat processing sectors, and 2,700 further recruitments are currently being planned. More than 5,000 Pacific and Timorese workers stayed in Australia working during COVID. The Australian government is grateful to these thousands of Pacific and Timor-Leste workers for choosing to work in Australia, for helping Australian businesses in our time of need. They're far from home, far from their family and communities, uh, from their one talks, and I'd acknowledge the sacrifice they are making right now. And that these programs are delivering for Australian farmers, for Australian Order. consumers and for our Pacific family. For our part, the Australian government is committed to the future of Pacific labour mobility and seeing workers and employers benefit from these highly successful programs. Senator McLaughlin, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister advise the Senate on how the coalition government is improving and streamlining Australia's labour mobility programs to further maximise the benefits of these initiatives for Australian businesses as well as Pacific workers as we recover from the pandemic? Senator Seselja. Uh, thank you, and I can. Last week, along with my fellow ministers Little Proud and Payne, we announced a public consultation <coughs> process to streamline our Pacific Labor Mobility Initiative. Now, our commitment is to ensure that Pacific Labor Mobility is sustainable and efficient into the future, and to position Pacific Labor Mobility for significant Order. future growth. Uh, through this redesign, we'll make it even easier to recruit Pacific workers to meet current and future workforce shortages, while also continuing to ensure the integrity of the programs and the welfare of workers. Now, worker welfare is absolutely paramount, and I can't stress this enough. Welfare and program integrity remains at the heart of our enhanced labour programs. But we also know that Pacific Labor alone cannot fill the huge seasonal workforce shortages that our farmers and rural industries will experience beyond the pan pandemic. As we consider how to meet future workforce needs, Order. we will ensure any new arrangements build on and complement the gold standard set Senator by our Pacific Labor Mobility Order. Programs. Senator Seselja. Senator McLaughlin, a final supplementary question. Mr. President, can the minister outline how these programs underpin our strong relationships with our Pacific and Timor-Leste family and the government's commitment to seeing these programs prosper and thrive into the future? Yeah, yeah. Senator Seljer. 
Uh, thank you. The Seasonal Worker Program and Pacific Labor Scheme are the centrepiece of Australia's Pacific step up and engagement in the region. The remittances sent home by Pacific workers are a key source of family and national income in the Pacific, and these will be even more integral to the pandemic recovery and future growth of Pacific economies. Now, through the streamlining of the programs, we are committed to growing Pacific labour mobility participation. Our Pacific and Timor-Leste partners should be confident that we remain committed to growing our Pacific labour programs. These initiatives are hugely beneficial for Australian farmers and our Pacific family, and the government's committed to building on this success. And we know from the great feedback from far Senator north Queensland to Tasmania that the Pacific will continue to be the priority partners for the Australian government and for Australian farmers for many years to come. It's disappointing the Labor Party seems Senator opposed by, by the nature of their interjection, Senator but our commitment to these highly successful Sorry, programs— Senator Selger, please resume your seat. Senator O'Neill, I have called you to order repeatedly by name. I ask people to at least pause breaking the rules before they recommence. Senator Seselja. Thank you. And unlike those opposite, it seems, our commitment to these highly successful programs and to the Pacific is Order. absolutely Senator steadfast. Seselja. Senator Kitching. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for the National Disability Insurance Scheme, Senator Reynolds. On the 11th of May this year, this minister was asked about the tragic death of 23-year-old Liam Danher, who died waiting for a seizure mat. The minister first claimed she personally had, had been in contact with Liam's father. Then she claimed she had offered to meet and been in touch with Liam's father. And then she admitted it was her office who had been in touch with Liam's father. Can the minister now clarify whether she has personally apologised to Liam's family? And if she has done so, when? The Minister for the National Disability Insurance Scheme, Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. And first and foremost, can I reiterate my condolences to Mr Dan uh, Hur's family. Uh, any death of a child is always tragic. Um, I have, my Chief of Staff has been in, in contact uh, reasonably regularly with Mr Dan Hur's father, who the family has relocated interstate. So I've offered to meet with him, uh, to, with, in fact both parents, at their convenience, and they have asked for me to wait uh, until I have further information, which will come from the outcome of the inquiry. Senator, have you concluded your answer? No. Senator, sorry, the minister's concluded her answer. Senator Kitching, you have a sup supplementary question. So, why, after 78 days, has this minister failed to pick up the phone to personally apologise to Liam Danher's family? Why has she left it to her office? Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mr. President. And as I've said, um, I, my chief of staff has been in contact with Mr. with Mr. Dan Hur, and I have offered, and through my chief of staff, offered to either in person or on the phone talk with Mr. Dan Hur myself. And my understanding is, he 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 does want to talk to me, but when I've got answers uh, that will come in the outcome of the investigation. So at that point, and at his request, that is when I will uh, have contact with him directly, if he still wants to have that conversation. Senator Kitching, a final supplementary question. When asked how many thousands of taxpayer dollars the Morrison government spent on legal advice and lawyers to deny Liam his $445 seizure mat, the minister failed to answer and falsely claimed she had been in contact with Mr Danher personally. Remember that? Will the minister now be up front with the Senate and answer that question? Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, if my chief of staff does something on my behalf, then I consider that is, that is the case. And I did, on further questioning, clarify that point, that it was, in fact, uh, my staff. Order. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Women's Economic Security, Senator Hume. Can the Minister outline to the Senate what the Morrison government is doing to develop Australian women's jobs of the future? The Minister for Women's Economic Security, Senator Hume. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr President. And I thank Senator Chandler for Order. this very important question and for her enduring commitment to the prosperity and progress of Australian women, and particularly their economic security. Yeah. As Australians on this and those on this side of the chamber know, the Morrison government is committed to seeing more Australians in jobs, and that is particularly so for Australian women. The best way to secure 
uh, women, Australian women's economic, to, sorry, excuse me, the best way to secure Australian women's economic security is to ensure that the economy is strong and that there are plenty of jobs to go to. Now, at present, there are more. There are more Australians in jobs than ever before. There are more Australian jobs than there were before the COVID-19 pandemic began. In March 2021, uh, women's employment, in fact, hit a record high. The women's workforce participation rate is now hovering around record highs. Uh, and what's more, the gender pay gap is at record lows, around 13.4 per cent, which of course is considerably lower than the 17.4 per cent that was observed during the Rudd-Gillard-Rudd Labor government. But Mr President, we're not resting on our laurels. There is certainly more work to do. The Morrison government uh, is particularly focused on policies that generate jobs in emerging industries, industries that require technology, skills in technology, in science and engineering and maths, known as STEM, and particularly so for Australian women, for these are the better and higher paying jobs of the future. Mr President, Australia's talent pool is too often limited by the underrepresentation of over half of Australia's population in STEM education and careers. We have such a highly educated workforce and a highly educated female population, in fact, the most highly educated female population of any developed country. Country, and yet there is a leaky pipeline and low representation of women in STEM. That's why in the 2021 budget, 22 budget, the Morrison government announced $42.4 million investment to support Order. women Senator to secure higher legislation. Time for the answer has expired. <laughs> Senator Chandler, a Thank you, Mr. Question. President. Can the minister advise the Senate of the anticipated effects of the government's measures? Senator Hume. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Yes, I can talk about the uh, more than 230 women who are going to pursue uh, STEM scholarship programs through, um, uh, through the Morrison government's announcements in the budget. In fact, this program will see more Australian women supported into the jobs of the future. The program builds on the Women in STEM Cadetships and Advanced Apprenticeship program that were announced previously, providing support for more women to undertake university-level STEM qualifications. These scholarships are co-funded with industry and, uh, and are industry-led in areas that are most important to that industry have identified identified as most important to them, those fields of STEM with the highest potential to support future growth industries uh, and better and higher paying jobs. For example, Mr. President, in the med tech industry, which was identified as a national manufacturing priority in the Morrison government's modern manufacturing strategy, uh, this is a critical field, in particularly in light of the coronavirus. Now, most importantly, these measures create a bigger pipeline of women entering STEM careers, as well as increased number of role models and peer Order, networks Senator specifically Hume. for women. Senator Chan or a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister inform the Senate of the industry and community feedback on these measures? Senator Hume. Thank you again, Mr. President. Yes, I certainly can. As a matter of fact, I've in, in visited very recently a number of organisations where the feedback to this program has been exceptional. A medtech organisation in Melbourne, SEER Medical, an innovative organisation which simplifies complex systems, medical systems into technologies that people can benefit from in the comfort of their own homes. I also visited Cicada Innovations in Sydney and met the CEO there, Sally Ann Williams. Sally is a terrific role model for young women contemplating a career in STEM and was particularly supportive of this government's actions to get more women into rewarding careers in Australia's jobs of the future. Misha Schubert of the Science and Technology Australia organisation said that the new STEM scholarship program will pave the way for more women and girls to study science and technology. Carly Walker, the CEO of the Academy of Technology and Engineering, also worked on the program, saying that increasing investment in STEM education and research translation will strengthen Australia's capacity to rebuild after COVID. And indeed, Michelle Gallagher, CEO of health data analytics company Opal, said that scholarships Order, with the private Senator sector Hume, are an excellent time investment. For the answer has expired. Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, Mr President. And my question is to the Minister for National Disability Insurance Scheme, Senator Reynolds. I refer to the Australian government's document entitled Australia's COVID-19 Vaccine Rollout, National Rollout Strategy. Um, it was available on the Department of Health website. Can the minister confirm that page two of that document setting out the COVID-19 vaccine national rollout strategy, aged care and disability care staff are listed under phase 1A? Minister for the National Disability Insurance Scheme, Senator Reynolds. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, I can confirm that. 
And as I said in my, pre as I said in my previous answer, for the, for the majority, the 270,000 workers, they are in 1B. And it is possible that uh, a number of workers who work in residential aged care were vaccinated as part of the aged care rollout. Order. Senator O'Neill, a supplementary question. Order. Senator O'Neill. Order. Senator O'Neill is on her feet. Order. Senator O'Neill. Thank you. Thank you, um, Mr. President. Um, Senator Reynolds, despite now being given multiple opportunities to correct the record, the minister has continued to insist that she's correct when she says disability support workers were classified in 1B. Will this minister now correct the record? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. And uh, as I've said, there were some workers who were in 1A, and I've said that's exactly right. Um, but the majority is in, is in 1B. The majority of the 270,000 workers uh, and their, care, their support staff and care workers are in 1B. Senator O'Neill, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Order. Senator Watt. When the minister herself doesn't even understand the Morrison government's COVID-19 vaccine rollout to disability support workers, and she has no idea how many disability support workers have been fully vaccinated, how can Australians living with a disability and their families possibly trust this minister to protect them? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. And I, stand by, I stand by what I said, and that is that we are now rolling out through five channels vaccinations for workers, for participants, and also for support, uh, support workers and also for their carers. Uh, it is true that in, in, in one, uh, it is true that in 1A, uh, some of the workers who work in either residential aged care or disability homes may have been vaccinated, but the majority now have the opportunity to get vaccinated at their convenience through five different methods. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Oh, Senator Wong. Uh, I, I sought leave earlier in the proceedings to table the document that demonstrates the 84 per cent figure, and I think that is now agreed. Leave is granted. Thank, Thank you. you. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Kitching. I rise to take note of the answers given by Senator Reynolds to the questions asked by Senators Brown, Ciccone and O'Neill. Um, the Morrison government's rollout of the COVID-19 vaccine for those living with a disability has been woeful. Woeful under this minister, woeful under the previous minister. In fact, let's face it, it's almost non-existent. In Senate estimates less than a fortnight ago, it was revealed that, wait for it, 355 people of more than 22,000 of people living with disabilities living in residential settings had been vaccinated, despite being in the highest priority group 1A. That's right, 1A. There has been a slight update to that figure, but it's still well below what would be rightly expected in a wealthy, first world and relatively privileged country such as ours. I was shocked when the government confirmed that they had not kept a record of how many disability workers have been vaccinated. As Senator O'Neill asked in her question um, and, and, and asked about families, how could they possibly trust this minister to protect them? Oh, you're leaving? Really? You're leaving? You don't actually want to, answer, you don't want to hear any of this? Really? And uh, just a moment, uh, Senator Kitching, if you wouldn't mind resuming I'll, your seat. I'll do it through the chair. Senator Henderson. Deputy President, look, I would just ask you to draw um, your attention to Senator Kitching to the standing orders which prevent senators from reflecting on a senator when he or she leaves the chamber. Thank you. Um, senator Henderson. Uh, yes, Senator Wong. Ms. Deputy President, there's nothing in the standing orders which prevents that. There are conventions around that, but I suggest if this senator wants to apply conventions, she should start observing some herself. That's right. uh, thank you, Senator Wong. Senator Henderson. Uh, um, 
I regret to say well, that in responding to the point of order, Senator Henderson, um, on just, reflection, I'll just conclude. Yes. I'll could I just make another point of order on another matter? No. Senator Henderson, yes. resume your seat. I'll conclude the first matter. So uh, it is correct to say that it's not in the standing orders, but it is custom and practice. And more recently, the president has drawn it to the chamber's attention that in the COVID environment, when we're not quite sure where's, whether senators take leave or not, it's not appropriate to, um, to make reference to whether senators are in the chamber or not. And now you want a second point of order. Thank you, Senator Henderson. Um, it is a breach of the standing orders to reflect on senators, and Senator Wan has just done that in um, relation Senator to me, Henderson. me raising the point of order. So I'd ask that she not do that. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Henderson. Um, I don't believe that's a point of order. Thank you. Please continue, Senator Kitching. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Oh, oh look there, Senator Henderson. Um, Are you leaving? No, she's uh, order. Reflecting. Order. Order. I would ask senators. Um, I've just explained the custom and practice. Um, I would ask people to observe that, please. Um, please continue, Senator Kitching. One only has to look at the hand side to understand why Senator Henderson needs to understand the standing orders and how to behave in committees. Um, as Senator O'Neill asked in her question, um, Australians, living, Australians living with a disability and their families, how could they possibly trust this minister to protect them? The NDIS looks after the welfare of the most vulnerable people in our society. And this is one of the most serious duties of our type of government, is to look after those who are vulnerable. But that will require, of course, the most capable, the most competent and the most composed, which, as we know from uh, Senator Reynolds, is not always the case, um, the most composed of the decision makers that this government can offer. The consequences of the poor leadership which we've seen from this government, there will be more people dying in their own faeces more people waiting for a wheelchair, more people approved of, for plans, but then die before they can actually avail themselves of those plans. This is a very, very serious portfolio, and Minister Reynolds, uh, who often has trouble with her recollection, as we've seen over this year um, quite a lot, um, Senator Reynolds is, uh, is actually not really probably the most competent minister to have this portfolio. There will also be more people left behind by an uncaring bureaucracy. Let's go to the NDIA CEO, Martin Hoffman, who told Senate estimates earlier this year that Liam's death was, and I quote, a complicated matter. That is what he said. Minister Reynolds also said, I cannot imagine the grief that they are going through. But actually what we've heard is, of course, she hasn't actually understood that grief because she hasn't actually phoned the family as she claimed she had done earlier in the year. So if this scheme was managed properly, then Minister Reynolds would not have to imagine the grief of the Danaher family um, and they would not have to go through it. But this scheme is not run competently by this government. Thank you. We have seen the dev devastating effects of the pandemic and what this does when it gets loose in aged care facilities. We should be doing everything we can to ensure that a similar breakout does not happen in the equally vulnerable dis disabled community. I mean, really, this is basic stuff, but the government continues to shirk its responsibilities, whether they are constitutionally mandated or not. They are much more comfortable outsourcing risk to others, including the states, than piling on when something goes wrong. Nowhere have they done this more in my home state of Victoria. During the recent COVID-19 outbreak, the Prime Minister had to be dragged kicking and screaming to help in providing even the most basic of support to struggling businesses and workers. This is a Sydney-centric government, and despite the treasurer of our nation being a Victorian, we were discarded, the state of Victoria was discarded on the road. Now, let's go back to people who are on the scheme. So you imagine them in the pandemic, cooped up for long periods inside their homes, terrified of the virus, some of them not, their condition not really being one that can actually deal with being coped up in, cooped up inside. But there has been bare minimum support from this cruel and heartless government. But should we be really surprised? I'm sure the minister, if she had managed to stay, um, has recovered from lo losing her previous portfolio and now understands the mess she has to fix that was left by her predecessor, 
um, the member for Fadden. Under his reign of errors, of course, it was revealed that 1,200 Australians with disability had died over three years Thank while you, waiting Senator to be Kitchen. funded by the scheme. Uh, your time has expired, and I, I don't want to have to constantly remind senators when I've drawn their attention to the custom and practice to not make reference to whether senators are in the chamber or not, to then have that same comment repeated again. Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Deputy President. Uh, the question of vaccinations uh, in this country in dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic is, of course, a very, very important series of questions. And uh, today, uh, there's been a number of questions on this particular topic. Uh, one of the most important things we need to be doing in coming in here uh, at this time is to be doing everything we possibly can to be encouraging Australians that are eligible right now to be able to go out, uh, book in a vaccination and get that done. Uh, we've got uh, hesitancy that exists within the community. We all know it. We get to speak to people. We speak to people in the community about it. Uh, there's a, uh, also, for some, there's a complacency. We're probably a victim of our own success in this country where COVID, uh, thankfully, uh, has uh, evaded uh, many, uh, so many of us because, uh, because of the success of the policies that have been implemented across this country, be it uh, policies of this uh, Morrison government or indeed those of state governments who have successfully also managed the health pandemic. And there is a, there is a complacency in, in, in some. And we have a responsibility as, uh, as political leaders in this country to come into this place and, and take that responsibility seriously and encouraging people, using the influence that we've got, to encourage people to uh, get out, book in a vaccine and make it happen. Uh, I've just recently become eligible in my home state uh, to be, uh, be vaccinated, uh, and so I've booked it in. As soon as I get back uh, from this parliamentary fortnight, uh, I'm booked in on the Tuesday, and I'm beginning my, my vaccine, my very first dose. My wife, uh, she's in, in health care. Uh, she's, in fact, had her two doses of uh, the AstraZeneca vaccine. Uh, she's a, a health care worker, and she took advantage of that as soon as she possibly could. And we need to be encouraging more and more Australians to do that. But what we see by these questions of those opposite coming in here is undermining the confidence that is uh, necessary to encourage Australians to get out there and make it happen. But thankfully, we are seeing uh, uh, many Australians taking up the opportunity uh, that's before them to go and get vaccinated. We've seen, uh, just to give you a, a, a bit of a, a taste of uh, what we're seeing across the country, it took 45 days for the first million doses for the first million doses. It took 45 days across Australia for those first million doses uh, to, be, uh, 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 to be put into the arms of people across the country. It then took 20 days for the next million doses to get us to 2 million people. Uh, it then took 17 days for the third uh, million, the, the next million, to go through. And then it was 13 days. So you can see that it's diminishing. It went from 45 days to 20 days, to 17 days, to 13 days, and in this last 10 days, we've seen another million doses. So we're seeing this uh, rapidly increasing vaccination program across the country. And instead of uh, highlighting the success of that, and instead of getting behind the success of that and encouraging even further, further uh, embracing of the opportunity to go and get vaccinated, we get questions from these op those opposite uh, that are uh, just really guided uh, by some sort of political motivation to undermine the, the confidence in the system. And it's disappointing when you come in here and you see that that's what's going on. And we had questions on this today, whereas there actually could have been questions about the efficacy of the vaccine program and how it's impacting and what it's doing. Uh, recently, we saw in Victoria, with the, with the cases go through Victoria, I heard of one particular example of where a 95-year-old gentleman uh, contracted, sadly, COVID. Uh, but because he had received the vaccine, he actually had no symptoms at all, and he's, and he's uh, got through his uh, case of COVID-19. And instead of highlighting the, the impact that this program is having, uh, we get questions that are seeking to actually undermine the confidence in the program, which is very, very disappointing to see indeed. We're seeing Australians step up to the plate. 
doing their bit to take up the vaccine, uh, doing their bit in spite of the, the great success that there's been across the country and the fact that we don't have the prevalence of COVID in our community. Australians know that the best way for us to move forward as a nation and to take advantage of all the opportunities that have been created, particularly across the economy. We heard today about the uh, last night we saw the announcement of the free trade uh, in principle agreement. Uh, there's opportunities that are bound for us as a nation, and we need to see Australians you, take Senator up that opportunity Sullivan. by Your getting time vaccinated. Has expired. Senator Carr. Well, thank you, um, Madam Deputy President. Uh, it was Gandhi that made the observation that a true measure of any society can be found in how it treats its most vulnerable members. And I think this issue that's been identified today in the questions that have been put to Senator Reynolds just highlights our difficulty in this country. We are not treating our most vulnerable in a humane and civilised manner. We are allowing our most vulnerable to be subject to a far greater risk, a far greater danger than need be. Now, the media reported today that the government was in fact uh, withholding supplies of vaccines from the states. The Victoria's COVID Response Commander, Jerome Vimar, has said that the state government was grateful that it received an extra 500,000 vaccine doses. And hence, the minister in question time today uh, repudiated the ABC report. Now, it may be asked, however, how is it that an extra half a million doses can be found so readily if doses are not being produced and imported that are being released? So, whatever the accuracy of the media reports, it's become abundantly clear that the Morrison government does not understand how to respond to this pandemic. It's preparing for possible future waves of virus, and if it's arguing that's the case, it's sitting actually on a stockpile. It's not the way to go. Increasing the production the distribution of vaccine is the answer to that, and the government should ensure that that actually happens. But it must also ensure that existing stocks are made available to people who actually need them now. And no group of Australians needs to be more fully vaccinated as soon as possible than the people with disabilities and for those that actually care for them. For the minister to suggest that this sort of laissez-faire approach, that it's up to individuals to get it sorted out for themselves, is simply not good enough. Many disability people are reducing their immunities and are extremely vulnerable in such an environment. The government's estimates about the number of people that have been fully vaccinated, some 355, and that was the position they put to the estimates, that's only 1.6 per cent of the people living in residential disability facilities. The government's confirmed that it just doesn't know how many people have been fully vaccinated. In other words, the rollout for disabled people, especially for those in residential care, is almost non-existent. Now, that to me is what constitutes a national disgrace. The Royal Commission, in only in May, rightly called out the slow rollout for disabled people as an abject failure in the vaccination program. And the responsible minister at the time was a minute little powder, however, was sought to say that the figures show that the vaccine rollout is working as he said as it should be because he said this was so because there was no COVID infections among people with disabilities. He was boasting about people's good luck. What he didn't say is not being vaccinated and confined to those people in their homes. It's been forcing them to live in what amounts to permanent lockdown. Nearly four million disabled Australians are cooped up in their homes, afraid of what the continuing pandemic will mean for them. And only this government, surely, can pretend that that's an acceptable situation for a country like this. The situation becomes so bad that some organisations working in the disability care have taken it on the role that the government is in fact shirking. Scope Australia, for example, has taken the matter into its own hands and opening up specialist vaccine hubs for people with disabilities. Admirable, even heroic. 
but that's the job the federal government should be doing, because only the federal government has the resources to do the job properly. Scope is asking for further clarification from the government as a guide for staff who may be questioned getting the vaccine at all. And you've got to ask yourself, how does it come to this? This government has been reminded many, many times that it has two jobs during this pandemic. One, the rollout, the other, the quarantine. And it's effectively shifted quarantine onto the states despite its constitutional responsibilities. And it's been dragging its feet in terms of the vaccine rollout itself. Thank you, oh. Senator Carr. Your time has expired. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. And in rising to take note of answers from question time today, I think first and foremost it is important for all of us in this chamber to remember the unprecedented nature of what we as a country, as a community, as a society have dealt with over the last 18 months. And, and I think it can be quite easy to forget the quantum of uh, policy response that has been required to deal with the COVID-19 pandemic in a country like Australia, where we have been so fortunate in the way the pandemic has been handled, um, to, to remember that it, it could have been a lot worse than this. I don't think anyone um, in this chamber 18 months ago, when COVID-19 first hit, thought that we would be in this position now, where we are rebuilding the economy, where we are um, developing and administering and rolling out um, a COVID-19 vaccine. I mean, we have to remember, 18 months ago, we were, weren't even sure if a vaccine could be invented in that shorter time frame. I can remember speaking to a few experts at the time saying that this sort of thing ordinarily takes decades. And we were able to do it, of course, with the help of experts around the world in a matter of months. And that is an incredibly, an incredibly impressive thing. And it's something that we have to keep in mind when we are thinking about um, the way that all levels of government have dealt with the COVID-19 pandemic and the response and the way that the vaccine has been uh, rolled out is that we are doing something unprecedented, unprecedented and, quite frankly, completely remarkable um, in the current situation. I was having a look at the news uh, during question time. Obviously, ordinarily, I would be paying attention to all of the questions and answers in great detail, but I did have a quick look at, um, at, at one of the, the news feeds and saw that we did tick over six million doses of the vaccine in the last few hours today. And I think that is a really exciting milestone that, that should be celebrated. And um, I come in here often and happen to do take note with uh, Senator O'Sullivan at the same time. And sometimes it's hard to find something to say after Senator O'Sullivan's made his contribution because he's so measured and reasoned and, and has said all there is to say. But I, I will um, touch on a few of the points that he made. And, and this is around the importance of the vaccine. And, and I, I think I have alluded to that already. But um, in hitting those six million doses today, obviously there is still work to be done. There are still phases to be rolled out. There are still people out there who are yet to have uh, a dose of the vaccine. I am one of those people. I am not quite yet uh, anywhere near the front of the queue, I, I suspect, given uh, my age, but I will be looking forward to having the vaccine when I am able to at the uh, young age of 31, um, because it is important that Australians do get vaccinated. We know that the vaccine is our best way of keeping safe from this virus and, and getting life more back to normal as we continue the COVID-19 recovery. And I see um, the vaccine is a really important part of not only how we deal with this issue through a health lens, but also through an economic lens as well. Um, if we can ensure that as much of the population as possible gets vaccinated, then we might have some hope of getting back to living our lives the way that we want. And if there is uh, one thing that I've heard resoundingly from Tasmanians in my local communities, but also across the country more broadly in the last 18 months, is that we all want to get back to normal. And I think that is uh, in entirely understandable. And Senator O'Sullivan spoke about in his contribution um, how 
rapidly the vaccination program is increasing. And again, this is a really important point. Uh, yes, we started off slowly, but I think that rapidly increasing rate of vaccination demonstrates that Australians do have faith in our vaccine program, and I look forward to seeing that vaccination rate continuing to increase, Madam Deputy President, President because, like I say, Getting as many people vaccinated as possible is key to our COVID-19 recovery. It is key to dealing with this health issue on an ongoing basis, and it is key to enabling Australians to get back to living our lives the way that we did uh, in a time before COVID-19. So an incredibly important issue that we have discussed here in the chamber today, and I'm just so proud of all of the efforts that our government is going to, rolling out the vaccine and ensuring that Australia can recover from the COVID-19 uh, economic and health issue. Thank you, Madam Thank Deputy you. President. Senator Chandler. Senator Chisholm. Thanks, Madam Deputy President. And if you heard the contribution from those opposite uh, during taking note, you'd think there's nothing wrong with the vaccine rollout. And I heard Senator O'Sullivan talk about uh, some of the questions from Labor that we're talking about here undermining confidence. Well, nothing would undermine the confidence of Australians than seeing the performance of Minister Reynolds today. Nothing would undermine the confidence, confidence of Australians than seeing the performance of Minister Colbeck over the last couple of months as well. Uh, and unfortunately, or sadly, I'm not surprised by Minister Reynolds' performance in question time today, because I think Minister Reynolds, well, I know Minister Reynolds owes her position to the Prime Minister. And I think that Minister Reynolds thinks that if you just emulate the Prime Minister's performance, then that's the ticket to surviving this government. Because we saw a minister today, in answering questions, fail to take responsibility, fail to take ownership of being responsible for vaccinating those most vulnerable Australians. And we've seen it from the Prime Minister down, time after time, when it comes to important issues confronting the most vulnerable Australians. And if you don't take responsibility for vaccinating the most vulnerable Australians, then what confidence does that give the Australian people that you're going to get it right? And the vaccine rollout is too slow when you compare our performance internationally. Uh, and that is something that Australians are going to have to confront over coming months. So it is disappointing that those people who work in disability have been let down by this government. It's disappointing that those people living with a disability have been let down with this government. And it's disappointing those Australians, families and loved ones who care for a person with a disability are being let down by this government. And it is a continual refusal to take responsibility for those people in aged care and those people in disability care. And it does undermine the confidence of the Australian people as a result. And the questions that we talked about today uh, from Senator Brown around uh, disability care workers, what became clear from the answer from Minister Reynolds was that there is no central register. And her, re her reason for that is because the workforce are transient. Well, that's exactly the problem. That's what we saw the problem in aged care, particularly in Victoria, because people were working between various uh, organisations as a result of the workforce. So it shows you the need or the urgency for actually having a central database so you can track who is vaccinated uh, and where they are working as a result. And then the minister claimed that they're not required to provide vaccination to their employer. Well, again, another problem that we identified and we saw what went wrong with aged care. You think the government would see that and act. Instead, the government see this and actually try and run out, avoid being responsible for it. They actually run the other way Rather than actually trying to fix these problems, they try and avoid taking any responsibility for it as well. So Minister Reynolds looks at the Prime Minister and thinks, well, he tries to get out of avoiding any responsibility. That's the model that I'm going to, I'm going to replicate as a minister. So no duty of care to those people that the minister is responsible for as part of her portfolio. Uh, and then in regards to uh, those people uh, in disability residences, again, there was no plan. A refusal to commit to, commit to a date to have these people uh, vaccinated. Uh, and then uh, the best the minister could do was hope that this was done as quickly as possible. So still we get the rhetoric from the government that this isn't a race. Well, I can assure you for those people uh, living in disability care, for those people who uh, are loved ones or friends of, 
Uh, I'm sure they want it to be a race. They understand how important this is, particularly when they don't get the other part of this puzzle right, which is on quarantine. They continue to avoid any responsibility for quarantine as well. So there's no wonder that Australians are frustrated but also concerned about the fact that we can get an outbreak at any second and it can have an impact in aged care. It can have an impact in disability care. And that is what concerns so many Australians. So we are being left behind internationally, and it's a government that aren't taking responsibility on these important, on these important tasks that they have as the federal government, uh, whether it be vaccinating those people who are vulnerable, uh, whether, it be, whether it be uh, bringing in proper fit-for-purpose quarantine facilities. They continue to thumb their nose at Queenslanders in that regard, uh, and it is so disappointing that we see the performance from Minister Reynolds today and again, a failure from this government to take responsibility for what the Australian people have tasked with them. Thank you, Senator Chisholm. So the question is that the motion is moved to, by Senator Kitching to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answer from Senator Birmingham to my question. Uh, earlier today in relation to the Prime Minister's announcement at the G7 summit uh, some two days ago uh, that Australia would be joining the High Ambition Coalition for Nature and People. Now, this uh, particular coalition of some uh, 70 uh, countries or 60 uh, countries uh, is a pledge to protect 30 per cent of, uh, of the world's um, land, domestic land, and 30 per cent uh, of the world's oceans. And of course, uh, what we have uh, from this announcement is more trickery from this government, more game playing from this government. Well, on one hand, they have committed to this uh, 30 per cent by 2030 by saying it is a combined 30 per cent together, uh, protecting the land and protecting the sea. When, of course, that is not what uh, this uh, coalition uh, of countries is calling for in the lead up to the biodiversity conference uh, in China in a couple of months' time. Uh, what they're asking for, of course, is for countries to be fully committed to protecting at least 30 per cent of land plus at least 30 per cent of their oceans from environmental devastation and destruction. So, just like we saw this government time after time after time lie, mislead, be tricky over Australia's commitments uh, to uh, reaching uh, their Paris uh, targets by counting uh, Kyoto carryover credits. We see again tricky accounting being used right here under this process. And for what purpose, Mr President? Is it purely so cynical that this government uh, knows that the people of Australia want our environment protected, so they say that they're going to do something while at the very same time doing nothing. In fact, Mr President, going backwards. And the reason I say this is because while the Prime Minister has been standing up uh, at the G7 saying uh, that Australia commits to protecting our environment, we have right here in this parliament this week the government introducing and pushing through laws that would weaken our environmental protection to pave the way for easier approvals for new mines and big development. And you don't have to take my word for it, Mr President, as to what is going on here. The Prime Minister himself declared that this bill that amends Australia's environment laws is precisely for the resources sector. It's for keeping the mining companies happy. The Prime Minister has said that himself. It has nothing to do with strengthening our environmental protection laws, to nothing to do in helping halt the extinction crisis that not just Australia faces but the world faces. And when it comes to the issue of extinction, Mr, De Mr. President, Australia, sadly, rates the worst in the world. Can you believe that? Isn't it just shocking that Australia has lost more native species than anywhere else in the world? 
We're a world leader in extinction, a shameful record and something that we need to start turning around and halting, which is why, under this particular coalition of countries, they are also asking for, for uh, signatories to commit to an extinction target, to halt the destruction of our wildlife, to stop the disappearance of our native species. But of course, Mr President, the Prime Minister didn't sign up to that particular pledge. The Prime Minister has uh, said one thing at the G7, but here in Canberra, at the very same time, his government is pushing through laws that do nothing to help the environment but do everything to make it easier for big mining corporations and big greedy developers to keep destroying wildlife habitat, to keep destroying Australia's precious environment. Saying one thing at the G7 and another thing here in the nation's capital. And Australians are sick and tired of this game playing and trickery of this Prime Minister. And here today, we've called it out, and the minister, when I asked the question, could not give a simple, straight answer. The question is the motion moved by Senator Hanson Young be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it.